David, your last contribution, subject to the questions, is now seven minutes, please. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you, Michael, for um, your engagement and the discussion this evening for so far and the points you've raised. I asked Michael to account for the objective nature of morality, and he told us that morality is a property of our brains. But there are all sorts of things that are properties of our brains. Goodness and love and mercy and justice and compassion are all things that humans do, and presumably, and, you know, we can relate that to what's going on in our brains. But so are murder and rape and selfishness and greed and all the things that we all agree are wrong. So merely to say that it's a property of our brains, I think, is no help. But we ha still have to decide which aspects of what human brains do is right and which is wrong, which is good and which is evil. Let me quickly move on to the problem of suffering, the problem of evil that Michael raises. Well, here I, I don't want to give any simple answers for this simple reason that there aren't any simple answers. But I'm not sure that Michael's argument works either. This is a moral complaint against the existence of God. He tells us that a good God wouldn't allow such things. But again, I've been asking Michael where he gets this objective notion of morality from, and I don't think that it's due to our brains as a satisfactory answer. There's also a, a general agreement amongst philosophers who debate this that evil doesn't disprove the existence of God, not in the logical sense. The reason being for the, the free will argument that Michael offered earlier, or mentioned earlier. Namely that even God, God can't do impossible things. He can't create a world of free beings who necessarily always do the right thing. I don't have time to go into many other issues of the problem of suffering. It's far too big a topic. But let me mention a couple of points. If God exists, our happiness is not the purpose of life. That is not the greatest good in the universe. The greatest good in the universe is to know God. And so there are many things which viewed from purely the point of our happiness would seem pointless. But from a perspective of knowing God, maybe things look differently. Now I'm not saying that accounts for all the suffering. There's a lot of suffering in the world that we can't account for. How as a Christian do I make sense of this? Ultimately, my question as a Christian is, can I trust God in the face of the suffering and the evil that we see in the world? And I think the answer is yes. And the reason is that God himself, according to Christianity, becomes part of the story of this world and enters into the worst kind of human suffering. I can't explain all aspects of suffering, but I can trust a God like that. But that brings me to the question of Jesus. It brings me to the question of the biblical criticisms that, that Michael offered earlier. Now, there are some aspects of these debates that we can rationally agree and disagree on. But there are some points that are clearly wrong. Michael criticised Jesus, saying we've got a mixed bag here in terms of moral teaching, that Jesus was commanding the, the killing of the children of Jezebel. Well, I think Michael needs to go and read the scriptures more carefully. This is in the book of Revelation, and it's to one of the churches there. Jezebel was referring to is referring in the, in the book to false teaching that has infiltrated the church. And when the children of Jezebel are mentioned, this is not young kids running around, Jezebel's children. This is people who have embraced the false teachings. So Jesus is not endorsing anything like that. Michael also talked about the chronological order of the, the, the New Testament, the writings of Paul, and then the Gospels, Mark. Matthew and Luke, and finally John. Now, I, I agree with Michael about the chronological sequence. I think that's right. But in fact, this doesn't undermine the argument I gave for the resurrection. This supports it. The earliest sources we have are found in Paul's writings. And Paul's writings are full of accounts of the resurrection, or at least of information about the resurrection. It's central to his teaching. And in a famous passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul quotes an early church creed, a, a creed that many scholars go, believe go back to, goes back to about three years from the crucifixion, telling us about various people who had seen the risen Jesus. So the earliest sources we have do confirm that people believed in the resurrection. In fact, this provides evidence for one of the facts that I mentioned. And as for the kingdom of God, well, the kingdom of God in Jesus' teaching was not um, that immediately heaven would come, but that 
Jesus was bringing the kingdom of God, that we can become part of it. My time is all too quickly running out, so let me try to bring my part of the, this stage of the evening to conclusion. I said it various features of the universe which count as evidence for the existence of God. I argued that in each case the evidence was strong and so overall provided a strong case for the existence of God. Michael's offered a number of criticisms, objections, but I've addressed each of them and I don't see any reason to believe that this in any way weakens the evidence for God. In the last minute or two, what I want to look at is our question again, does God exist? Or to put it a different way, is it possible to have knowledge of God? It's important to distinguish between two kinds of knowledge. Knowledge that God exists and knowledge of God. The first, theoretical knowledge. The second, knowing God personally. It would be very easy to get the impression from a debate like this. That it's, it's all just about theoretical knowledge. It's about weighing up the evidence for and against. And while that's important, there's more to it than that. The philosopher Paul Moser argues that God is not primarily interested in humans beings acquiring more theoretical knowledge. He writes, a God of, worthy of worship would not be in the business of just expanding our databases, but would seek to transform humans motivationally. According to Moser, thinking about God's existence is not a spectator sport, but is morally challenging and humbling. If we take the God question seriously, it has huge repercussions and we will need to be willing not merely to change our beliefs, but also our lives. So is it possible to know God in this deeper sense? For our lives to be transformed by God, who is the source of love and forgiveness? I believe it is, for two reasons. First of all, there is good evidence that such a God exists. And secondly, because Jesus has made it possible. And there is good reason for this through his resurrection from the dead. So I hope that you will pursue not only theoretical knowledge of God's existence, but this transforming knowledge available through the person of Jesus.